I'd like to introduce Dr. Marty Chalfie. Actually, I'm going to talk about strange things about science. Um, I, I had to give a talk a little while ago to some high school teachers, uh, and I started thinking about what I was taught in high school about science. So basically what I'm going to talk about first are all the myths that I realized talking to these uh, teachers and that I had. And they're myths because, uh, well, they're all involved in the examples that we hear about. Einstein, Galileo, Newton, all of these people. And I just want to run down these things before actually going and showing an example of some science that shows that all of these things are completely wrong. So uh, the first thing is that scientists are supposed to be geniuses. I am not going to show you a slide of my, uh, you want me to be closer to this? Okay. I'm not going to show you my grades. There's something because scientific stories have to be said quickly that we sort of think that their experiments work all the time. They think differently from everyone else because they use this peculiar thing called the scientific method. They come up with a hypothesis, they come up with the experiment, they test it, the experiment works immediately, and they get all the glory from that. Another thing about all the examples is that scientists work alone. They might have an assistant named Igor, but other than that, they're completely on their own. And all the examples I was taught in high school, every single person, except for one person, and that was Marie Curie, all of them are white men. So uh, I'm going to give you an example of a story in which all of these things are not true. Um, and my involvement in this starts because I work on this small worm. It's a, wonderful uh, creature to do studies on, but I'm not going to tell you about it except to say one important thing about it. It is transparent. We can look at it and see every cell in the animal. You can't tell what they are in this picture, but they're all there. The time that I'm really going to start the story, I was interested in, we had cloned several genes in the lab, and we wanted to know in what cells were these genes active. And at the time, because DNA makes, RNA makes protein, we had a lot of ways of answering the question. We could make a probe to the RNA, and if it was made, we'd see it in the cells. Or we could make an antibody to the protein, or we could make the gene make something else that we could see, and then we could see that it was working. All of these methods worked. They answered the question, but they had a problem. And that problem was, in order to do the experiments, we had to prepare the organism by killing it, fixing it, poking holes in it so the reagents could get inside. And we were therefore only getting a very static view of what was going on. Now, uh, at this time, which is about 1989, I heard a lecture that told me about this man, Osamu Shimomura. Shimomura shared the prize with me in 2008. And he uh, is an amazing person. So I'm going to give a little advertisement. If you have about a half an hour go online to nobelprize.org and read about this man. At the age of 16, he was told, you have to quit school. You have to work in a factory. So he quits school. He goes out of the city, over the mountains to the adjacent valley, and starts working, which turns out to be good because the city was Nagasaki, Japan, and the time was 1945. And by being on the other side of the mountains, he was protected when the atomic bomb destroyed the city. He has no school to go to. After the war, he eventually, the first school they build is a pharmacy school. He goes to that. He, after pharmacy school, he works as a technician. He's given a project that's basically considered impossible by everybody, but he's a very good biochemist and he's able to do the uh, experiment, and his boss is so impressed that he gives him as a going away present a PhD. <laughs> he then comes to, uh, comes to the United States and decides that he's gonna try to address a very interesting question. Why is it that this particular jellyfish produces light? Why is it bioluminescent? And so he goes to study this, and this is, this is the part that talks about the scientific method. He's trying to figure out how this works. He collects thousands of jellyfish, grinds them up, extracts the proteins from them, and only to find that the experiment fails. 
and it fails repeatedly. He tries different variations. It simply doesn't work at all. He keeps trying, has some ideas about changing things. Nothing works. Finally, one evening, it's very late. The experiment has failed one more time, and he sort of gives up, decides to go home. He throws the stuff in the sink, all the preparations in the sink. The sink has jellyfish parts, some seawater, and some other things. And as he does this, it, it, he throws it away. He turns off the light. He's about to leave, and he looks back at the sink, and he sees that the sink is glowing brightly. And it's glowing brightly because the sink had something that he didn't have in any of his preps. It had calcium. And he uses that, he realizes that calcium's in the seawater. He uses that to purify the protein, which he names after the jellyfish, called a corn. So he has answered the question, how is light produced? But by a complete accident. However, he has a bigger problem now, because although he has found the molecule that produces light, it's the wrong color. It's blue instead of green. He knows the jellyfish produce a green light. He reasons there must be something there that converts the blue to green. He goes and takes a handheld ultraviolet lamp, looks at all his samples, and sure enough, finds one with a protein that gives him blue light, a green light back from the blue. He refers to this as the green protein. We call this now green fluorescent protein. And in the paper that he wrote up about the first protein, the corn, this is a footnote. This is a man who's won a Nobel Prize for a footnote because GFP. So I'm listening to a seminar about this, and I realize that this is what I've been looking for for all my scientific career because if you shine blue light on this, you can see green. So wherever you have a cell make this, you will see it. In other words, it's going to serve as a lantern that will allow us to see things in the cells. And so. I immediately did what any self-respecting scientist would do at that point. I got on the phone and tried to find out who was working with this. And I found out that this man, Douglas Prasher, was in the process of isolating the DNA. There's some problems. We lost track of each other. He thought I had dropped out of science. I thought he had failed in his experiments. But three <laughs> years later, um, Gia Skirkin, a new graduate student, came into the lab and she uh, was the person that I told about this. We found out that Douglas had actually gotten the DNA. We got back together. Collaboration was going to go. And one month after Gia started uh, graduate school, she was able to see that there were bacteria that she could put the DNA for green fluorescent protein, shine blue light on the bacteria. They had made the protein. We could see them. There's another part in this page that I always like talking about the scientific method. At the top, it says she used the microscope in another laboratory. And the reason for that is that she's a very good scientist and knew that the microscope in my lab was a piece of junk. And it, she really couldn't see the green fluorescence. And so she went to this other laboratory where she had worked previously and was able to see this, thus saving the project. But this gave us a problem which was we did not have a microscope we can do any of the experiments with, and that was essential. So I solved that by calling up all the microscope representatives in New York City and saying that we had just developed a method that we could look at cells and could we possibly, we were thinking of buying a new microscope, but before we did, we wanted to try them out. <laughs> and so if they could bring it by for us to try it, we, we would appreciate it, and especially if they could leave it for a couple of months. So all the experiments were actually done on borrowed microscopes. We were able to put this into the worms, and here's a picture from the cover of the issue of Science that we reported on this. I want to say something briefly about the problems of scientific publishing. Some of you may know that the journal Science is a very esteemed journal. Just ask anyone on their staff. They're very, <laughs> very uh, excited about themselves. And they're so, uh, they think so highly of themselves that they don't actually send your papers out for review unless they've thought about it for a while and decided that you're worthy enough to have your papers sent off. And uh, they wrote me and they said, or they called me and they said, uh, you know, we're sorry we're not sending your paper out for review. 
And I said, why not? And they said, we don't like your title. The title I had was Green Fluorescent Protein, a New Marker for Gene Expression, which I thought was a nice, snappy sort of title as far as scientific papers go. But they told me that the reason they weren't sending it out is that everything in their journal was new and you couldn't use the word in the title. I don't like being told what to do, so I asked them if, it would, if they'd send it off. I had a different title and they said yes. And so in retaliation, the title I actually gave them was the Aquari Victoria Green Fluorescent Protein Needs No Exogenously Added Component to Produce a Fluorescent Product in Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Cells. This is actually the entire paper. It got accepted, and then the copy editor called me up and said, you know, your title's a little long. Is it, is it possible for you to make it shorter? I said, yeah, how about this? <laughs> green fluorescent protein as a marker for green. And that's the official title. Now, this, that's the first of three problems with publication. The second was this picture. Now, I'm really excited about this, this picture because it shows not a dead uh, preparation, but this is actually a living animal that we took this picture on. And you'll see that, that there's one long green line at the top. That's one nerve cell, but the one right under it that's sort of shorter, that's actually a growing nerve cell. And we could actually watch the cell growing in an intact animal. And that was very exciting. So I wanted to do this. I sent it. The art cover editor called me up and said, you know, we really like your picture, except we have a problem. And the problem is that there's one color we really don't like to ever use on the cover, and that's green. Can we change the color? And I said, no, I'm sorry. It's got to stay this way. The third problem we had is we had been giving samples away to lots of people to uh, see how they could do uh, with this uh, material. And uh, I wanted to say in the paper that it had worked not only in our systems, but in other animals and plants and so on. And I wanted their permission. And everyone but one person said, absolutely. You gave it to us before you published. Of course you can cite our material. One person had a number of conditions. This is a letter. You probably won't be able to see it. But it says that I can quote uh, her uh, work as long as I make coffee every Saturday morning for the next two months, ready at 8.30, prepare a special French dinner, and empty the garbage nightly for the next month. This is my wife. <laughs> but what she did was a really wonderful experiment. You know, genes are, have really two parts. One part is the code for making a particular protein. The other part says where, when, and how much. What we had shown is we had taken that controlling part and said, whenever it's on, you're going to see green, because now we've replaced the protein part with the part for GFP. What she did is she took the controlling part, the protein she was interested, and then GFP, and basically hung that lantern on the protein and could watch what it was doing. And in her case, it was producing this, the green protein in the cells on the left here and making them move into the other cell. So you should actually watch proteins transported from one cell into another. And that was very important. Over the years, GFP has been used in lots of different organisms. Uh, I just want to point out one here. That's ALBA. ALBA was commissioned by a, uh, from a French biotech company by the Brazilian artist Eduardo Koch so that he could go around at his various art shows and get people to talk about the connection between art and uh, science and uh, art and technology. <clears throat> As I say, it's been put into lots of organisms. I only know of um, one organism that it has not officially been put in as far as I know, and that's us, because you have to put the DNA in. Although uh, it, the idea of GFP was used uh, by Ang Lee to explain a particular phenomenon, and that's this one. Um, if you look at the beginning of Hulk, uh, his movie, it actually starts off with a jellyfish and they extract it out. So this is GFP somehow has gotten into Bruce Banner, and whenever he's angry, that gene gets turned on in his skin, and you see the result. So why is GFP useful? It's useful because uh, it's DNA, we can put it into virtually any organism, and the, that organism and all of its subsequent progeny can make GFP. Looking at it, you just shine blue light, you see green, it doesn't hurt the organism, it's small, it can get everywhere, 
and we can, as I said, look in living organisms. So let me finish. I'm going to skip over some things here. I just want to, I want to say one or two things. The first one is, uh, not that, I'm going to do this. GFP has been used, we've used in our lab in many ways. It's been used to look at how HIV gets transmitted from one cell to another. This is very important. HIV, if you want to make a, uh, a vaccine against that, maybe it works like almost every other virus. The cell explodes, virus is out there, then an antibody to that could scarf it up and somehow get rid of it. But that's not what happened. They made HIV making GFP so they could find wherever the virus was, looked at it in mouse cells, and what it turns out is that if you have an insect infected cell, it comes up to a non-infective cell and transfers the virus from inside one cell to inside the other without ever it going outside. It has incredible implications on what you should do in terms of trying to combat it and trying to stop it. GFP has been used to look at various health issues like this, basic biology, but it's also been used, for example, you can put GFP in a bacterium under one of those controlling elements that allows GFP to be made when uh, the explosive TNT is around. And you might ask, why would you want to do something like that? The experiments are still ongoing. It hasn't been perfected. But one thing is that landmines have TNT in them. You don't know where the landmines are, but if you could spray a field with them, as a man named Bob Burledge did, and then go back at night with a UV lamp, wherever there were the landmines, he could actually find the fluorescence of GFP. And I'm a little over time, so I think I will stop here. Thank you.